what do you want to do with the Plunkers Shield? We had a game washed out, Central District Stags versus the Auckland Aces, which obviously makes things um, a bit interesting there. We had a big win for Canterbury. They scored 266 runs and then rolled the Northern Districts Knights for 113, 121. This morning, I wrote about those Canterbury Seamers who are absolutely on fire. And we also had another loss for the Wellington Firebirds. Like, well, it's still in there. Why do the Firebirds suck? But Tommy Blundell! The big man, he scored some runs. But only after um, Dale Phillips popped up for a 250-plus scores in either innings. That's something I've got to write about. Dale Phillips, big up to him. I actually wrote about him at the start of this round because he did score that 65 in the first innings, and that was part of like the Otago Vaults trend of recruitment because last summer they brought down... Dean Foxcroft, who I, I believe is um, stuck in South Africa or something like that. They brought him down from the CD Stags. They brought Nick Kelly down from the Northern Districts Knights. And this summer, they or last summer, they also brought down Dale Phillips from the Auckland Aces. He's the younger brother of Glenn Phillips and is very similar to how Glenn Phillips bats. Very aggressive, very funky. Um, but the Otago Volts do a great job of recruiting players from around Aotearoa to bring them in and give them an opportunity to go with their local talent. I think there's uh, the CD Stags Seema, Jared Mackay also moved down to the Otago Vaults. So how you view that is up to you. I just find it like funky recruitment. The Otago Vaults have a lot of like younger-ish local players and they are bolstering their squad with really smart, efficient, effective recruitment moves. Dale Phillips is one of them. Hamish Rutherford also scored some runs. Then we had Jacob Duffy taking a forfer. And then Dale Phillips and Hamish Rutherford scored runs in both innings. So shout out to them. Then we have the big old Tom Blundell Hundy. And his dismissal where he was just probably like, fuck it. I'll handle the ball, stop it from touching the stumps, and I'll cop that obstructing the field. Obviously, Tom Blundell, he wasn't the wicketkeeper in this game either. Those uh, The wicketkeeping gloves went to Lockie Johns, I think it is. And Tommy Blundell was just opening batsman, no wicketkeeping, hundy, which is good for him. Um... Where do you want to where do you want to start there, Wildcard? Do you want to start with the Canterbury Seamers? Do you want to start with Tom Blundell? I think we've got to start with Tom Blundell because we've got to do him justice. Like we talk we've talked a lot about Tom Blundell and his lack of runs. Now we probably need to talk about Blundell and his runs as well as like what the fuck's doing with Wellington. Yeah, I can't say anything about Wellington because I don't know what's going on there. Uh struggling mightily. Um and I don't have an explanation for why that is, but um, Tom Blundell, yeah, man, like hey, I guess the I guess the wicketkeeper gloves were just weighing him down or something, because for the first four innings of the season, he wasn't just bad; he was terrible. Like I whipped up the stats from the different openers through the first two rounds. I'll see if I can find that sheet and update it after the after the third round. But like Blundell wasn't just bad; he was arguably the worst opener for any team um and maybe that was because they played twice against canterbury because i guess we will talk about those canterbury seamers and just how excellently they've been bowling he had to deal with that against the new ball every time so uh, maybe didn't maybe didn't help matters but um they take the gloves off him and he scores what 30 odd in the first 31 of 59 in the first innings and then 101 um of 147 so a strike rate of only a shade under 70 in the second innings. And that was a big hundred. Like no one else in that team scored more than 17. Finn Allen was the next top scorer um, tied with extras. When when extras is your second tied top scorer, you know, you're in trouble. Um, But that hundred gave them a chance to win that game. Ultimately it didn't happen because like 
Jacob Duffy was bowling too well and they just ran out of wickets and they don't seem to have anything of a middle order these days, Wellington. Um, and also Blundell got out very early on the last day when if he had stuck around, that was the like that was their avenue to victory and instead he decided to handle the ball. Um, <laughs> it's a weird one. Um, it used to be, apparently they changed that rule as well. I only just learned that, I guess, because it's something that happens so rarely. They just sort of merged the old handled, out-handled ball rule in with the obstructing field rule. So it's all just counted as obstructing the field now. Um, coincidentally, I saw a tweet from Francis Payne, who's always amazing at these things. The last player to be out for obstructing the field in a domestic game in, in um, New Zealand was Will Williams, who is the shining light at the moment of that Canterbury seam crew. So um, can't stay out of the headlines one way or the other. Um, yeah, I suppose we just got to say Tom Blundell well batted. Like it was a bit of a counter-attacking effort. He scored very quickly. Maybe that's the secret is he needs to be a bit more aggressive and stop trying to bat like an opener and start trying to bat just like Tom Blundell, but opening. And like, however you go, this was the first, like runs have not been easy for anyone, like for obvious reasons to start this blanket shield season. The weather has not been kind. The pinches, pitches have not been kind. And a couple of bowlers are just out of their minds at the moment. But this was the first hundred by any opener this season. So like as much as he struggled leading up into this game, he was outstanding in this game. So, like, Tom Blundell, I suppose we suppose he'll be opening the batting with Tom Latham when it comes to comes to that first West Indies test. Like, a, that's your reward. Like, that's what he was playing for. And he just delivered the highest score of any opener so far this season. So I suppose that's what you, therefore, earn. For sure. It's... How, do you, how do you just view Tom Blundell among that Wellington team? Because... Let me just check how many runs Devin Conway's got this season. He's still, oh god, he's still leading all run scorers despite having a nightmare against the Otago Volts, did he? Yep, he scored four and he scored sixteen, and he is still twenty runs ahead at the top of the run scoring charts. Holy cow! Shout out to Devin Conway, having scored twenty runs in this game, out out against uh, the bowling of Jake Duffy in both innings. Yes, too. indeed. So. Um, but there has been a struggle for the Wellington Firebirds. Maybe, maybe Blundell's their barometer, and they just need old Blundell to lead the way and get back into the Black Caps, settle down into the Black Caps, and then the Wellington Firebirds will be moving and grooving. Um, as, yeah, for Blundell, it just the reason we talked about it so much is because it is a an amazing scenario. It's not that. Tom Blundell is shit, or Tom Blundell is amazing, as somehow Tom Blundell... Like, Tom Blundell has scored test runs. He scored test runs on debut, and he scored test runs opening the batting in Australia. Not the easiest things to do, right? So he's... We like Tom Blundell. We enjoy a bit of Tom Blundell. Somehow, some way, this... Tom Blundell just found himself in this, in this situation, and it's amazing... And it's a, it's just super funky. It's like, how the fuck did this happen? And it escalated with Tom Blundell not scoring many runs to start the season. Now he's come in with a century. And I don't know, like when you saw Tom Blundell was moving to his century wildcard, did you just feel yourself like settle down? Did you just feel like, ah, everything's all good? Because I think that's how I got it. Like, <laughs> yes, I love the um, unique nature of the scenario he found, he found himself in. Yes, I like talking about it and um, offering my insights, but also just opening people up to the fact that Tom Blundell was opening the bladding for the Black Caps test team and he wasn't for the Wellington Firebirds and all of that shit. Like just opening up, opening people's eyes to that, which we did writing about it and talking about it. But at the end of the day, I felt a sense of ease and calm when I saw that Tom Blunder was scoring runs. Yeah, my reaction was maybe less of a things are all good because I not necessarily. I mean, this is this is the conundrum that I find myself in, is I watch him bat and I look at his highlights and I say, I don't see how that lives up as a long-term, like, over an extended period of time, 
test match opener, the way he bats. Like, he bats like a middle-order wicketkeeper, which is exactly what he has been his entire career. And just the illogical way that he's fallen backwards into this role, and it's a really crucial role in the Black Caps test team. So you're opening the batting, like you're walking out there on day one, to fa- uh, well, probably not to face the first ball. I expect Tom Latham will take that particular duty, but like that's an enormous role within a Black Caps test team. And it's not a role he's had any preparation for prior to doing it in the test level. All those things make me think this shouldn't have happened. And let's just like hit the reset button and get out of this weird situation that we find ourselves in. But at the same time, if Tom Brun- if Tom Blundell like scores runs, then there's no arguing. Like if you're scoring runs in this role, then who cares how you do it? As long as you're scoring runs, that's the only currency that counts. So the fact that like while so while he's struggling um first couple rounds, I'm like not it's not doing the head in because like you say we sort of thrive when there's a bit of weirdness going on because we get to be the ones to come in and write about it and talk about it on the podcast and explain like. Well, hold on, this is how we got ourselves into this situation. So I don't know if I felt like when he suddenly did score a, a lovely little 100 um, in tough conditions too, like I reassert that part of it as well. So this, was, this wasn't just like a um, clumsy cruising to victory, like miles ahead in the second inning, setting a total against demoralized bowlers kind of thing. This was him battening in the fourth innings to try save slash win a mat. I mean, their best chance was probably to bat out long enough that the rain came, but... You know, he took really, like really tough runs, great hundred, like fantastic innings. Um, when that happens, I don't know that I so much felt like things are all good so much as I thought, well, okay, like this is probably more of the thing is, okay, right, this is the situation we find ourselves in. There is a lot more clarity now that he scored some runs in this role because now we don't have to worry about what the hell goes on because the reason he's pushed into this role is because they didn't have anyone else to open the batting even though we knew that Jeet Raval was struggling for ages which is the craziest part of all of this is that they were there were already calls to drop an opener and they didn't seem to have a clue of who would actually come in if they had to drop an opener but the fact that like and that hasn't really changed because what you get in these kind of situations is when there's no clear pathway you get a whole bunch of people all putting their hands up to try compete Blundell being one of them and there have been some impressive um, efforts from other openers in the Plunkett Shield this season. Um, so I just just to having him score some runs wasn't so much like a I'm happy that everything has worked out well, but it was a like I suppose more of a relief to say okay at least we know what's going on now. Like Tom Blundell is earning his stripes as an opener. That's what we needed to see, and that's what he's done. Breathe out, exhale, kind of thing. Yes, I, I'd agree with that one. I, in the short term, it just seems like the Black Caps need Tom Blundell to open the innings. We don't like the best case scenario for the Black Caps Test team isn't to go back to Jet Raval, nor is it to usher in a younger opener like a Henry Cooper, who is scoring runs right now. Rachin Ravindra hasn't scored runs this season to be honest, so he's not really putting himself... Well, Rachim Ravindra takes over the Tom Blundell role of borderline worst opener in the Plunkett Shield now, because he failed both innings again. Like, we know how good he can be. It's clear to see what a talent he has, but he has been straight up awful so far this Plunkett Shield season, which uh, I suppose (laughs) maybe he's just doing it to ease the pressure on his buddy Tom Blundell to make his uh, like just one less competitive for that opening spot. Maybe he's just being a nice dude and he'll just come out and score a double hundred next time. He's averaging 9.6, so yeah, uh, big up to him. It's not good. But my point is that it's like we're in a stage where it's right where we are right now, we don't want to be calling on a younger opener to do a job for the Black Caps. Like I still, as much as I like a Henry Cooper, or as much as Rachin Ravindra is being like he's got the weight of uh influential backing as much as those two have their little things probably another year or two away from really putting themselves in the mix so like the best thing for the black caps test team is tom blundell opening the batting now it's debatable whether you view tom blundell as the best opening batsman not named tom latham 
in red ball cricket. That's where things get a bit weird. But just for, because I, oh, I don't. Here's here's a question for your wild card. Here is a question. I am pondering a. I'm I'm saying situation and scenario a lot, so I'd try and use less of those words for the remainder of this podcast. I am pondering how the Black Caps test team looks because a bunch of Black Caps with the Northern Districts Knights didn't play and we also have Kane Williamson and Trent Bolt in the IPL. Now there's those aren't my reasons. They are just things that are happening because like the Northern Districts Knights Black Caps, the likes like Colin de Grandhome, Neil Wagner and Tim Southey all didn't play against Canterbury. They were told they were said to have injuries, but they might not have injuries. They might just be like, Yeah, we played a couple games to get our bodies tuned up to play cricket. Now we're gonna take some play off time off just to best prepare ourselves for the Black Caps test cricket. Like that's understandable. Or like just for the Black Caps upcoming cricket if you're like a Tim Salvey, Colin de Grand home, play T twenty cricket, whatever. Like it just seems like a logical thing to do for someone for players in their position just to not play one or two Plunkett Shield games. So you got bigger fish to fry as much as we love the Plunkett Shield cricket. I understand it's all good. In the IPL, in theory, Kane Williamson, uh, Trent Bolt, to a lesser degree, Mitchell Santner, Jimmy Neesham, Lockie Ferguson. In theory, they just come back from the IPL and they everything is aligned so that they can just come back into the Black Caps setup. Again, I don't know the Black Caps schedule off the top of my head, so I'm kind of just like free balling that one. Um, so those things are happening, and I'm just pondering because I come back to Tom Blundell and I'm thinking, okay, like if there's, well, there's just this vibe of a bit of a kerfuffle. And to me, it's like a, it's been building because we've had a couple super duper settled summers with the Black Caps, where the test team is the same, exactly the same across four tests, two at the start of the summer, two at the end of the summer, and the same 11 test players play all four games. Like, we had that situation along with, like, fairly settled and steady ODI T20 teams for the last maybe five years, maybe three years. And then last summer was a bit of a, bit of a change because the tour to Australia was a bit of a nightmare, injuries, um, different players came into the test team, there were different uh, combinations and all that stuff just, it was a diversion from how matters with previous summers had gone. So part of me is like, okay, like I sense that this coming summer probably be a lot more similar to last summer than it was compared to the previous two or three summers. Then you factor in uh, all the the funk around the IPL crew and just how they're going to transition. You, I start to ponder, like, what's doing with Tim Saudi, Neil Wagner, Colin de Grandhome? Do they actually have injuries? Are they just taking time off? What's doing? Who knows? So there's like this, I have a sense that Black Caps cricket could be very much a kerfuffle as far as team selection goes. Not a kerfuffle as in, you know, why the fuck is this guy selected? Well, it makes no sense. But a kerfuffle as in, a kef- a, holy shit, let me just slow down because I'm kind of processing all of this in my head as we speak. It will be a kerfuffle in the sense of, well, we came from a very tidy room with Black Caps selections, especially in Test cricket, last summer, couple socks on the floor, you know, just t-shirts thrown over there. This summer feels a bit more kerfuffly, and if that's the case, you want Tom Latham and Tom Blundell opening the batting every game. Like, you, do you catch my drift here, Wildcard? You don't want the kerfuffle stretching to 
an area of the black caps that doesn't need to be shaken up right now. Like if, to be honest, if we have a black caps batting lineup that has Tom Latham, Tom Blundell, and Ross Taylor batting number four, okay, that's all good. Because wildcard, I just forgot Henry Nichols is out injured right now. AJ Patel is out; he's out injured right now. So there's that vibe, and I'm just like, well, first you can. I would welcome your feedback on the um, this idea that things could be a lot different for the Black Caps this summer. But to get back to Tom Blundell specifically, the Black Caps need Tom Blundell scoring runs because they need a settled opening part- partnership in the context of what could be a very mix-and-match kind of kerfuffly group. Yes, like just let's not take on more problems than we can handle kind of thing eh like it's a gut feeling of mine that tim Southey, colin de gronholm neil wagner probably all like maybe they maybe there were no injuries at all they just list them as injuries and call it rest like they do in the nba a lot um or maybe it's like i don't know tim Southey just felt a tiny little twinge in his hip or something and was like I mean, it's fine, I could bowl 50 overs today if I needed to, but if it did get worse, I don't want to miss the test matches, so maybe I just won't play this game. Like, a very, very, very safe precautionary type of uh, thinking. I I suspect that's closest to what we had going on, Um, so I don't know. Like, just gut feeling, I think everyone's going to be healthy and fine and ready to go, even Henry Nichols. Like, I... I wouldn't be surprised if he plays next round. Um, even if he doesn't, the first test isn't for oh, at least three weeks because there's a 2020 series before they play the test matches, which is going to be a weird one because at least three of our 2020 um, dudes are going to be coming, or well, probably four, maybe five actually, um, borderline five guys who would be um, first choice internationals, at least three or four of them, will be coming back from the IPL, will have to do their quarantine, at the same time as a lot of West Indian dudes for their 2020 team also will be coming back from IPL and having to do some quarantine. Like, their West Indies team is already here and getting ready, but that's not the entirety of their squad, and there's also two squads because they're playing Tess and they're playing T20, so not every player is in both squads, right? So um, there's that little complication. and You add in little injuries and whatever. Um, it does get... for uh, Matt Henry is another one as well. Matt Henry's got a broken thumb and should be back just in time for the first test matches. I don't know that he would actually play test bat by a, I think Carl Jamison's very, very clearly exceeded him at this point, but um, there are a lot of, it's not that there's a lot of problems with the potential black caps team there. It's just that there's a lot of things that have like, not, not that there's a lot of things that have gone wrong, but there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Like there's a lot of moving parts where say, Kane Williamson comes back and he fails a coronavirus test in quarantine and he's got to stay longer or something like that, you know? Suddenly he's missing the 2020 series and, or say, like, um, I think Williamson actually had, had a little bit of an injury while he was in the IPL as well, eh? So it's just a lot of things were like factors that it's sort of, it's not that there's anything that's gone wrong or even things that you would expect to go wrong, but these are the kind of things you do have to keep in mind. And so, like, moving parts staying fluid being aware those kind of things whatever um plenty more cliches where that came from yeah it it is it is but what i what i will say is that i think from having uh a lot of the kerfuffles last season i do think they have a lot more of a clue as to like what would go on like we know if if williamson's out devin conway probably comes in if williamson and henry nichols were to miss test match well, Will Young comes in as the extra one. Um, Colin de Gronholm is a straight replacement by Daryl Mitchell because that's what happened when de Gronholm missed a test against England last year. Um, there's, you know, Glenn Phillips is hanging around as well if they need another batsman. Um, there's, there's like, I think they've got a better clue as to which backup options are there. They're getting closer to a point where it's like like for like, where if one player's missing, another one comes in. AJS Patel, I don't think they're going to pick a spinner anyway, so it probably doesn't matter. Um, same boat as Matt Emery there, but they have good depth for seam bowlers at the moment, and even if they don't, like, just find the next 
Brent Arnell or Michael Mason to play a couple games and they'll take wickets because it's New Zealand in the start of a um, summer and it's been very wet and everyone's taken wickets at the moment in the Plunkett Shield with Seam Boland. So, I, I mean, <laughs> one way or another, it all comes around to the fact that I think they'll be all right when they play the West Indies at home in what might... I mean, it's we're three weeks away, so maybe the weather will be beautiful and sunny by then, but there'll still be probably a little bit of juice in the wicket. I'm sure they'll be fine. Um, but yeah... <laughs> The opening batsman seems to be the one thing where they don't have a backup plan necessarily, and therefore let's not overcomplicate things anymore when we already know that there are a lot of complications that aren't aren't necessarily going to happen, but potentially could happen, and you need to be aware of those things. What do you see in the Canterbury bowlers that is interesting to you given the fact that they're dominating. like I'll run through some stats just to set it up. Will Williams, 18 wickets at an average of 9.9. Fraser Sheet, 15 wickets at an average of 9.9. Daryl Mitchell, 12 wickets at an average of 13.25. Ed Nuttall, 8 wickets at an average of 25. Fraser Sheet came into the first 11 when Matt Henry got injured. Ed Nuttall didn't play the last game. And Fraser Sheet and Will Williams are both averaging under 10. The only bowlers who are averaging under 10 who have taken lots of wickets are uh, Sean Solier, Kyle Jamison, Will Williams, and Fraser Sheet. So Canterbury have two of the four players, two of the four bowlers averaging under 10. What are you like when you're seeing Will Williams bowl, when you're seeing Fraser Sheep bowl, even Daryl Mitchell, who's been pretty damn impressive this summer, I ran through some of his career statistics, and this is by far and away his best season with the ball. I think it's the first season since he debuted where, if I remember correctly, in which he is averaging less than 30, and he's averaging 13. So that's Daryl Mitchell's hit a completely different level since joining Canterbury. Like, how do you see? What are you seeing with what they're doing? Are there any things that catch your attention? Is there just like more questions than answers? Because that's what I see with Will Williams and Fraser Sheet. I'm like, these dudes, oh, it's the same stuff I talked about last week. Like, they don't appear to be bowling overly fast, but they're accurate, they move the ball. Maybe they're benefiting from the conditions at the moment. I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts on those Canterbury seamers? What are your insights? How, like, what do you see with what they're doing? What impresses you, etc. Well, what we don't see is like Kyle Jamison levels of swinging the ball around corners and just nipping it off the seam and getting bound. Just like really obvious, skillful aspects of how to get batsmen out. I don't know that you see a lot of that from these dudes, but that can be like the secret in and of itself, I suppose, is if you're just like, if you're that relentlessly accurate. And I don't know that like Williams or Sheet are particularly fast, but they're probably like above average or at least not below average for pace just at this, on this Plunkett Shield kind of scene. There's not a lot of bowlers who are out there um, hurling at 140 plus, I don't think. Um, certainly not at this time of the year and like that level of accuracy and just doing like doing just enough with the ball kind of thing will get you wickets and I suppose the the secret probably for Canterbury is there's no release because as you went through all those numbers like um, everyone's taken like all their seam bowlers are taking wickets there's the big three at the moment of um, William Sheet and and Mitchell, but it's not like Ed Nuttall's been bowling badly or anything. It's not like Matt Henry wasn't taking wickets when he played that first game as well. Like they're just as a unit bowling extremely well together and given given opposition teams like no way out and eventually that pressure works and everyone's just like bathing in wickets at the moment because of it. Um I will say that because I think they've played two games um at home in the Canterbury region and their other game was at the basin against Wellington probably the two best places like to be bowling seam bowling at the at this time like at the moment those are the the ideal places you want to be um bowling in that kind of way just nipping the ball around a little bit at a decent 130-ish clip like 
that that helps that the um the conditions have definitely benefited but i mean canterbury keep winning as well like the teams they're playing aren't getting the same benefits as they are so clearly they're doing something better than the better than the competition um I mean, Canterbury have won all three games, haven't they? And like, that has been the secret because they've got they've got decent little runs. Like, um, uh, our boy Leo Carter's not had copious amounts of sixes, but he's had a he's had a couple and he's scored a couple of nice little fifties. Daryl Mitchell has a hundred, doesn't he? Cam Fletcher, um, Tom Latham scored some runs early on. Like, they're getting they're getting timely runs, but. It's it's the Canterbury Seamers that are winning the show for them. Like they're the ones that are out there winning these games, and I suppose this. I mean, yeah, I I I don't know exactly what it is. Like I can't analyze it any deeper to say what's going on, but it does seem to me like the the secret source is probably just like combinations, like just how well they're bowling as a group, and it's probably something that we underestimate when we look at cricket stats. Is um the role like we can look at the individual this guy scored this many runs this guy took this many wickets divorced of everything else but sometimes the context of that is like how well like just think how many wickets dan vittori must have gotten for a, like a dude who had a test average of probably about 34 like nothing special whatsoever but how many wickets would he have gotten for bowlers at the other end just because no one could score runs off him that kind of thing like at the moment canterbury are just chipping away from both ends no release like that's at like right now in the Plunkett Shield first half of the season, that is going to be a recipe for success. And it has been. And I think just the way they bowl in a unit is probably the key to what's going on. There's a notable lack of spin bowling, um, which isn't really that interesting. Well, it just, it's just how it is in, um, or surprising in no. November where there's uh, green wickets everywhere. Are you, more interested in I'm not, I don't have the table right here let me just have a gaze are you more like I'm um, trying to say are you more interested in what's doing with Wellington or what might be doing with the Knights if I can just confirm they've lost two games won one game so it's not terrible but it's also but they yeah um, yeah I'm not worried about the Knights at all um yeah, so we have Wellington. Well, there's two different Knights teams anyway, isn't there? There's the Knights when they have all their black hats, and there's the Knights when they don't have all their black hats. And we've seen both those versions so far this season. Exactly, exactly, which is could be interesting. Might not be. Who knows? Any other Plunkers Shield matters that you want to touch on? We had no play Central Stags versus the Auckland Aces. Nothing doing there. So we're only up to two games. Um, Dale Phillips. Dale Phillips, any Otago matters that you want to discuss, Wildcard? Uh, not so much Hamish discuss. Rutherford? Yeah, Hamish Rutherford getting some runs. I would, I would say not so much discuss with the Otago votes, but I will say that I'm not putting out expectations here or anything, but I will be disappointed if... Why, oh, do I say the next 12 months? Or I say, let's say by the end of the summer. By the end of this... Um, yeah, by the, end, by the end of this Black Caps summer of cricket... If Jacob Duffy hasn't played at least one twenty twenty, I'll be uh, not, uh, maybe not disappointed, but just a little bit sad. I mean, I I fail to see what more that dude could do other than be like the. Do you, um, yeah, okay. This is going off in a little, not a tangent, but it's a little bit of a stretch for the metaphor. But like, you watch um Crystal Palace play in the English Premier League, right? And they are a team of mostly battlers and Otago, I don't think it'd be unfair to call anyone battlers at the Plunkett Shields um, level because it is a battlers kind of uh, arena, but they don't have the level of talent that other clubs have. They don't seem to produce quite as many as, um, as other franchises, I should say. And they're very good at recruiting in order to make up for that. Um, Crystal Palace are the kind of team who never seem to get relegated but they never also seem to look particularly good. But they have one dude in Wilfred Zaha who's just like a step above everyone else and should really be playing for a better team. But he, he got a chance with Manchester United, didn't get to play much, and then got sold. And it's sort of like, oh, well, that was him. Now he's back at a Crystal Palace level. And like every week, he's the best player on the field for them. Constantly winning penalties, constantly getting fouled and chopped down, but like leading the way 
a step above everyone else, raising the level of his teammate. It seems like Jacob Duffy has a sort of a similar kind of role like that with the with the way the Otago Volts bowling lineup goes. Like he's not necessarily getting the most wickets every single game, but he's always given you the platform from which everyone else can then do their job. And he did actually get the most wicket. He got four for him both innings in this game. But um, I would be yeah a, a little bit sad um, if that isn't at some point rewarded because he does this every year with like higher honors so I just think that would be uh the kind of thing you should be rewarding um as black cap selectors i'm just thinking for a 2020 here or there or something like that it's not like they haven't had a rotation of of um plunkett shield-esque bowlers in that team pretty easy to find room for him especially if you want to rotate a little bit um with a with a future world cup or two in in mind It'd just be a little bit sad if that doesn't happen you know jacob duffy has a he's currently though it's hard with the rankings because a bunch of dudes have played different amounts of games um but he has taken 17 wickets at an average of 16 so unfortunately wildcard jacob duffy is the only player in the top four wicket takers which is at least 15 wickets so four bowlers have taken 15 wickets or more and jacob duffy is the only one averaging over 10 so which is still, like, he's still averaging 16. That's not bad. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. You've got to be averaging under 10 these days, wildcard, to make an impact. Um, Otago lost their first two games as well. So they were, he's doing this for a team that had been struggling until winning yeah, yeah, very yeah. nicely most recently. Well, you'd be happy to know, wildcard, that last summer, Jacob Duffy averaged 22. This summer, he's averaging 16. So after. So, yes, is what I'm saying. Like earlier in his career, so. He debuted 2011. It seems just like strictly off the top of my head that 2000 between 2011 and 2013, a lot of these dudes came in because I'm thinking like I was writing about Daryl Mitchell and I was checking his career numbers. He made his debut like 2011 and 12. Like that seems the purple patch for a lot of these dudes. And I think like, Ed Nuttall and Kyle Jamison made their debuts around that time as well. Just a weird little note. Um, but as Duffy like started his, so he's got a great one day record, a great list day record. He's um, average of twenty three in list A cricket, average of twenty four in T twenty cricket, first class cricket. He averages thirty two. Now that is because in his first one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. First seven seasons, he averaged less than 40 twice. So his averages were 29.5, 51, 53.6, 24.0, 75, 46, 51. Like that's just, that's a bowler trying to figure out first class cricket. As a, as a young dude, like he's only 26 years old, so he would have been early 20s, if not even 20s by then. However, what well, and then his last, so in his four, in, wait, 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 in his first seven seasons, he averaged over 40 in five of those seasons with the ball. In his last four seasons, he has averaged under 25 in three of those seasons. So on the one hand, you've got a tough start to the career in first-class cricket because his record in one-day cricket and T20 cricket is really, really good career-wise. But first-class cricket, tough patch to just settle into his groove. But now those numbers are swinging around closer to alignment with his white ball bowling. And so that is a perfect recipe for someone to to make their international debut. Is It's it's not quite like... So if I think, like, why did Kyle Jamison debut before Jacob Duffy? It's because Kyle Jamison had an impact and was consistently pretty good across his whole career outs like barring injuries 
for like everyone has a different journey, right? Everyone has a different path to wherever they're trying to get to. So it's not necessarily like who's better. It's just how your path unravels in front of you and why that happens. Like in a general life context, the longer and windier your road is, the more rewarding it's probably going to be because you learn a lot more. You've got more time and more space to learn and grow as opposed to like immediately reaching your objective and then you're like, oh, I don't know who I am. Like, what the fuck? Oh, my God. And that's when shit kind of hits the fan. So in this case, Jacob Duffy's gone on his little journey and he's gone on his just however his career has unfolded and now it seems that he's turning a corner and there's a there's a clear difference in those first five, six, seven years of his career compared to someone like Kyle Jamison. And that's that's why Kyle Jamison is in the position he's in and Jacob Duffy's in his position. But if we're thinking about Jacob Duffy moving forward, there's a clear trend that has emerged in his last four seasons, apart from... 2018, 2019, he had a rough go um, that season. But he's he's a, f- like, I don't I just don't want to say he's a far better operator now because I remember being impressed by him earlier in his career the same way I was impressed by Jamison. Um, but it just now seems to be really clicking for Duffy and he's got back-to-back seasons of being one of the best Plunkett Shield bowlers. Not only that, he's... You know, one of the, because a lot of the time it's Hamish Bennett dominating all wicket takers. You know, it's a veteran who isn't really going to be trying to crack Black Caps test cricket. They're just dominating kind of past their prime, international prime. Um, But Jacob Duffy's, he's been top of the wicket taking charts for a couple seasons now, back to back seasons of really good bowling. So, if there was a time wild card, now seems like the natural time because you couldn't say Jacob Duffy should have been selected in 2016 when he was up to his neck in those seven seasons averaging over 40. Five seasons averaging over 40 in his first seven seasons. Now things have changed a bit and it would be a massive reward for him. Like He's toiled for so long and he's... It's just been an absolute mission and one of those long, winding roads. But now there are some heavy stats that back up um, maybe the eye test. And now those stats are really making an impact. And that should at least get him into a New Zealand A team, which, of which there is plenty of cricket at A-level coming up over the summer as well. Like there's, There are opportunities to see who like the next well 11 to 15 depending on how much they rotate and what players are needed for black caps duties like that just that next group of dudes directly below the immediately like contracted black caps lads there will be opportunities to see how that how that like thinking is going so um well yeah it was have, i mean i'd be sad if he doesn't play some international cricket. I'll be shocked if he doesn't play any of that A stuff. Um, and am I right? Didn't he go to England for a little bit as well? Does he apply to that thing we were talking about earlier about players skipping out for a little bit and coming back better players for their overseas experience type of thing? No. He didn't. I must be thinking to someone else. I don't, I don't think so. Uh, Matt Quinn, like they're very similar bowlers. Matt oh, Quinn maybe that's plays who I was for thinking Essex. Of, yeah. Yeah. Um, the forgotten man of Kiwi cricket because Matt Quinn has played in the Super Smash for the last few seasons. And at any stage, well, not any stage, but at some stage, assuming it's part of the... Because I think Matt Quinn has a British passport, so he can play county cricket as a local, and that's beneficial to him and the counties. Um, But I think he might have to like stay in England for X amount of years or whatever it is. But at some stage, Matt, Matt Quinn could come back to Aotearoa and play consistently in the in the domestic circuit and be a factor because he's a factor for Essex. Like he's he's doing some decent things with um, Essex. I'll just pull up his little um, 
Crick Info profile just to drop a little bit of heat on Matt Quinn. He, so they've been playing T20 cricket up until like midway through September. Matt Quinn was taking wickets in every single T20 game <laughs> that he played for Essex. And I'll just pull up his, um, just for a bit of a laugh here, I'll pull up the career, uh, the T20 Blast, which is the T20 competition in England where Matt Quinn is bowling for Essex and he took 10 wickets at an average of 21. So if like Matt Quinn is doing okay for Essex in county cricket, Essex are usually playing uh, Division 1 as well. Um, plenty of amazing cricketers play for Essex and Matt Quinn's a factor there, so you'd assume he may be a factor in Aotearoa as well. So definitely don't sleep on that. One more little train spotter note for you, Wildcard. I mentioned that the top of the wicket-taking charts right now do skew a little bit younger. So the leading bowlers, Wildcard, in the Plunkett Shield, Will Williams, Jacob Duffy, Kyle Jamison, Fraser Sheet, Daryl Mitchell, Sean Solier, Michael Ray. They're all younger seamers, which is pretty cool. Like that's in itself, that is really cool. That there are that the best seamers and the best bowlers in the Plunkett Shield right now are all under like Daryl Mitchell might be a bit older, but he's an all rounder, but like straight up seamers, they're all under the age of twenty eight, twenty seven. But if you and if you go back to I just chose a random season, two thousand seventeen, eighteen. Here's the leading bowlers from that season wildcard. Ajaz Patel, Logan Van Beek, Hamish Bennett, Jeden Patel, Matt McEwen, Ian McPeak, James Baker. All a bit of the grizzly veteran variety, right? Like there's a clear difference between the best bowlers this summer and the best bowlers of the randomly chosen 2017-18 season. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, Will Williams, actually, I think he was part of that little wave you're talking about, that sort of 2011-12, because I think that was when... Um, cause he's older than I thought. He's about 28 or something, eh? Um, but he's definitely like on that breakout. But I'm actually just looking... Because you're talking about Matt Quinn, and I'd comp- using <laughs> the forgotten man in New Zealand cricket, I'd literally forgotten all about him so much that I thought he was Jacob Duffy for a second there. So, yeah... Um, that adds up, but it reminded me of that time. You remember when Andrew Matheson played an ODI for, for um, I had to look it up to remember his name for the Black Caps. Like they were in England, and then there were some injuries, and they had to call up a dude who was playing club cricket because they didn't have someone like who was going to be quicker than flying someone over from the other side of the world. So Andrew Matheson ended up playing one ODI, took one for forty from uh, four overs. So not the best run rate, but at least he got himself a wicket. And then I was looking at. The players who have debuted since that, so that was in 2015. Um, Ish Sodi, George Worker, Henry Nichols, Lockie Ferguson. There's a nice little uh, George Worker hasn't played since 2018, but the other three are all still there or thereabouts with ODI squads. Um, all three of them were at the last World Cup. Then Scott Kugeline, Seth Rance, Todd Askell, Mark Chapman, Tim Seifert, Tom Blundell, and most recently Kyle Jamison. And I'd really say, like, that's three plus years. Um, the last sort of, what, eight eight names there? Seven, eight names there? Astle doesn't seem to be much of a factor these days. Seth Rance, I'd be surprised if he gets back in uh, again. Like, Tim Seifert will get more opportunities. Tom Blunder will probably get an opportunity or two down the line as well, even though uh, he has a, a test match opener these days. Kyle Jamison will play heaps of ODIs because he's excellent. And Mark Chapman might get some more. But none of those guys are really, other than Jamison, none of those guys you would think are top choice ODI guys at the moment. So it does seem like there's been a little bit of a... I don't, just just feeding into what you're saying about a lot of guys on the fresher side of things having breakthrough seasons at the moment. It does seem like that ODI squad hasn't had much of a freshening up for a little while like it, it might it might be um and it wouldn't even necessarily be needed for another couple of years but it is something like a factor to look at that they haven't exactly been like replenishing it much at the moment um, or for the last three or four years so that is another another thing to consider when you're looking at that wave of of younger bowlers is that they will be needed at an international level soon enough 
maybe this summer. Bit of a kerfuffle this summer. It's it's the one. It's the one. Right. Kerfuffle's going to have to be the title of this podcast. It's the kerfuffle. A, uh, you know, maybe a cricket with a K. A cricket kerfuffle. Cricket kerfuffle. <laughs> there you go.